yes, we have made it. Um, apologies to all of those people last week who um, chewed in and actually got nothing in return. The best laid plans of mice and men. And in fact, as a lot of us discovered, mice actually got into our servers. So a lot of problems. However, this week, uh, we're back on the air, and um, as always, my name is Martin Raymond, and I am the co-founder of the Future Laboratory. So this week, we're going to look at, well, three things. We're going to be looking at the um, quick preview, for those of you who haven't seen it, of our future forecast. So the Future Forecast 2023 report. Um, I'll also be answering some of the questions which you have been asking over the past week. So those of you who sent questions in, we'll be certain to be able to answer them. And if we have a little time left at the end of it, we'll also be looking at just some of the things coming up in our calendar for 2023. And just um, details for those of you who have asked about our community network, how you can go about joining that. But first, let's kind of crack on with some of the content, the key areas of the report. Okay, so if you remember back in 2022, quite a lot of us were talking about the great re-engagement. You had the great resignation, then you had, as we called it, the great re-engagement. And then of course you had the notion of the great disruption where suddenly everybody, was going through a period of disruption, but also, as we know, with disruption comes innovation. So really, we wanted to remind people that despite the changes, if you looked at what was happening in terms of patent registrations and looking at how a lot of people were, were re-engaged with innovation again, the highest growth on patent filings happened in the first quarter of 2022, so up by 21% alone, which, you know, if you think about it, is quite extraordinary. I actually looked at the figures for this year, and already uh, in the first quarter, we are seeing equal numbers of new patents and um, innovations being registered. So just a reminder that in any kind of crisis comes opportunity. And really, that was the point of us publishing our futures report. We wanted to look at a number of things. One was, what are the big changes taking place? You know, where and what are the sectors they're happening in? And in fact, when we looked at it, there were 50 different major cross-sector trends and shifts, uh, which we could identify in the report. It also contains quite a lot of global case studies, and of course, consumer behavior shifts, and crucially, a lot of interviews with the innovators themselves. So think about that. All of those things packed into it, plus, and we're going to be tracking this over the next year, our Futures 100 innovators will be updating you on them and giving you all of the, the I guess, the insights and changes that they are bringing about in the market. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, first off, you know, think about what's happening in luxury. Well, those of you who've been asking questions and sending those questions in to me have spotted that there's quite a massive return to what we have termed gilded luxury. So this is luxury at the top end of the market, you know, luxury that's been isolated completely from what has been happening with the rest of us. You know, we're talking about a cost of living crisis, but actually on the top end of the market, they're really looking at a cost of living well crisis, how to do it better, more gilded, more gated, more enclosed. So that, well, that's one of the key trends we're seeing coming in for 2023. Um, the other areas we're beginning to see is how multi-sensory luxury is again coming into its own. What do I mean by that? Well, simply put, Quite a lot of research, research been done into um, neuropsychology, into what we're calling um, neuroaesthetics, so the neuro arts generally, and a lot of that being applied to how you create experiential and immersive moments that really do resound with the brain. So it's not just about the emotions of 
uh, how we can communicate in a luxurious way. It's actually about how the brain can be changed in a particular way or order of pattern to stimulate senses or moments that feel luxurious. So quite a, a kind of a key shift there. And really that feeds into what we're calling the VIC of the very important customer and how a lot of these changes and shifts are being defined by the conversations with them. So these are not people who are on middle incomes or high income. You're still talking about the top 4% who, for example, can afford that suite at night that's been opened in the Dior store in Paris, 25,000 euro per night, or the new luxury suite at Claridge's, which comes in at a resounding 100,000 pounds. Per night. So we're really talking about a completely different audience when we look at what's happening in luxury. Beauty, on the other hand, you know, again, quite a lot of shifts here. We're seeing that um, neuro aesthetic coming in in beauty, where they're using sound, using smell, using light to communicate or to um, connect with the brain in a different manner. So technology being applied there science being applied there, but also I think, and this is one of the big shifts we're beginning to note, how longevity, so not just about aging or anti-aging, but this push to extend our age beyond, well, if you're a man, beyond your late 70s, if you're a woman, beyond your late 80s, and to do it scientifically and aesthetically, but also emotionally. So quite a lot in the report about how brands are intruding or journeying into these areas. And then also, again, staying with the science, thinking about how a lot of these things are being produced in the lab. So think about biotech, synthetic, you know, think about how the CRISPR scissors, that great shift that we had, um, which, which won the Nobel Prize, how that's been applied to beauty to extend our sensitivities, but also to extend how we create ingredients that actually can be used in a more scientific and controlled and strategic manner. So no longer about the aesthetics, we're really getting stuck into the science of what's happening in the natural realm. So that's beauty for you. Next up we have, well, both, of course, are connected. You talk about beauty, and previously it would have sat in its own category, but now we bold beauty and health and wellness together. So it's much more holistic, uh, much more about exploring not just the science of it and not just uh, the notion of digital solutions, but we're seeing a lot of AI tools being used to help us capture data differently so we can use our sense of how to improve people in a better and more holistic and opportunistic way. One of the areas I think it's happening is, of course, in what we have titled care community. So think about putting two words together, care and communities. A lot of us using platforms, using Web3, using uh, even WhatsApp groups to support and speak and communicate with, your, with each other with a view to improving our mental as well as our physical health. And I think that, of course, brings us in to the area of what we've called holistic therapy, which is really, I guess, about how we're expanding um, health and wellness out into the bigger community. So rather than just seeing retail and then seeing chemists and, and um, consultation clinics separated or segregated on the high street or the mall or whatever, we're bringing all of these things together so you can be familiar and see that they sit in the real world. They're part of our uh, development, they're part of our journey, they're part of our education. So why lock them up or hide them behind closed doors? So again, just bringing these things out into the open in a different way. Uh, next, we have, well, when you were talking about health and wellness, they were talking about drinks. But I think what's interesting about this whole area is that if you see at the bottom there, that, that whole thing about positive abstinence, 
how, for example, we are not just embracing sober curiosity, which is one of the movements we identified in, I think it was 20, 2018, when Ruby Warrington, um, who created the term, wrote a book about it and actually started talking to us on the network about how it would become a pretty big, she said, pretty global trend. But now positive abstinence is a step moving on from that where people are saying, well, actually, it's not just about abstention. It's about doing it in a proactive and conscious and caring way. So it's also helping other people who are trying to do this and also creating brands that allow you to do it easier in a more collaborative and, and collegiate manner. Um, I think the, the, the second big trend we've looked at in the, the kind of drink side of the report is how it's not just local products as we think about them it's products coming in from other cultures so products like spearhead spirits for example uh, an african-based business where they're using ingredients found in 36 different countries and building them back into drinks so we can experience drink in a different way with different flavors and different references and really i guess it's about decolonizing the whole nature of how we look at drinks in a kind of European context. And of course, just the final one there about heritage. Yes, despite the fact that we live in the future, a lot of us live in the past, but, and this is a crucial but, it is about being conscious about the heritage of where drinks come from, the references that it could either consciously or subconsciously be making, but also making new connections with heritages we're rediscovering, or in fact, seeing for the first time. So quite a lot of things happening in the branding and marketing area of drinks that you probably need to well, brush up on in the report. Ah, slow fade there into fashion. Yes, uh, you know, thinking about what's happening in fashion, we kind of saw the area of what we're calling dark dressing, you know, quite a lot about how people are embracing a, a more gothic aesthetic, but we're also seeing how uh, that is spreading over into the mainstream and, and you're getting this trend called anti-dopamine. So it's almost like running against happening, there's running against joy scrolling, running against how, well, on one level, people are celebrating and re-embracing culture again, but on another, we're just embracing the darker, uh, quieter, um, perhaps more um, frightening or scary moments based on, well, recent memories of events and current events happening in the Ukraine. So nothing surprising, but it's certainly a big factor that's driving sales in key areas currently. Uh, the second thing to think about is how, yes, we have vintage, we have um, resale, you've got brands like Vestiaire doing quite a lot in this area, but we're also seeing brands themselves invest in their collectible archives or create archives, which they are putting up online and allowing us to either buy, rent, um, take out fragmented shares in, or to actually protect. So there are some of them offering us moments where we can join the curators to save the brands in a different way. Now, quite a fascinating area to think about brands having to kind of uh, look at what they've done previously as a way to understand what they could do next, which I think is really where we go to in our textile innovations, looking at, for example, how new types of material, new kinds of upcycling, new kinds of synthetic and biotech are being used to create a different brand of fashion that isn't just sustainable, which is a term that we, I think, at Future Lab probably discounted in favor of regenerative and circular. So those two terms, regenerative and circular, are the ones to look at for 2023 and kind of suggest that we park uh, sustainability on the, the hard shoulder and abandon the car and run towards those terms, as I mentioned, regenerative and, of course, circular. Now, fashion, after fashion, we have, yes, uh, into retail. So thinking about what's happening in retail, uh, a lot of talk about Web3 and a lot of talk about decentralization. And I think where we're beginning to see this take place is the growing number of communities 
that are developing and the number of collaborative uh, networks that are growing where people are sharing insights sharing knowledge about products but also sharing costs you know a lot of the things we're looking at it's about how communities are developing to help people better understand better negotiate better well collaborate and work with brands in a way that suits all parties especially when it comes to data uh, hyper physical I mentioned um, neuro aesthetics earlier and really what we're beginning to see is how this has been activated like you've got people like Ivy Ross for example you've got Susan um, Megsiman who have created and I've written a book actually which has just come out which is all about how our brain as I mentioned before has been stimulated in particular ways by how we engage with the world of art architecture and design and really what we're beginning to see in hyperphysical are the first designers and architects and and um, store interior designers who are using the signs to better inform how we as customers react to the products and services as we see them so if you think about um simple illustration you know certain colors will stimulate serotonin certain shapes certain noises will uh, release dopamines, you know, certain things will, will cause endorphins to rush through our system. And what they're doing here is really harnessing the science to allow designers and retailers and brand strategists to create moments when this happens physically as well as emotionally. And I think that kind of brings us into that area of what we're talking about, the exclusivity mindsets where increasingly brands have to offer more to get more back from their high spending customers so really across retail luxury hospitality particularly that top four percent are really back in the market and a lot of brands in the absence of money coming from from the tears and sit beneath are having to up the game and really change the language of communication and of service and of high level engagement to attract these customers back to brands so that's retail in 2023 and just kind of thinking i've mentioned about hospitality but thinking about how travel you know to, to park that word sustainable um, because I do think we need to park it and to park terms like green or to park terms like you know uh, brands that are, are are kind of um environmentally concerned we really have to think about regenerative growth key point key area and um, proactivism or being proactive when it comes to how we deal with a brand's intrusions on nature or when we're traveling or when we're living in local communities. And then finally, because we still haven't forgotten about COVID and there are still a lot of people who post COVID are without the funds and because of the current um, cost of living crisis are really having to struggle. So the home body economy, which flared up during um, COVID, quietly settled down a little bit it's now back on the market again so let me give you two images in America you're seeing a return and certainly in the UK a return to what I call you know kind of double down hedonism where people are re-engaging regardless of income back in the market partying it's hugely about glamour hugely about prom moments, hugely about, well, if you think of films like Babylon, just out currently here in the UK, a lot of people re-celebrating the 20s, the roaring 20s again, in terms of partying as if COVID and the current crisis have never happened. On the other hand, some of us are doing it in clubs and bars and hotels. Also, some of us are doing it at home. So don't forget about the whole body market it isn't about abstemiousness. It's also about hedonism, but seen in a different sphere and in a different category and a different innovation. So that's what's kind of happening in travel for 2023. And we have, yes, there we have, at that point, we got to our future forecast. Now, I'm not sure if people have sent in questions already. It looks like there might be quite a few in our chat. But I had um, a couple of questions which people had sent to me. So I'm going to kind of go through them first and then see if um, anybody else 
has any other questions. And one of the, the I think the, the common ones, which um, we, we kept coming back to, I kept receiving uh, details was about, was how luxury brands, we've talked about this high-end gilded luxury, and somebody said, but surely they're older consumers or older VICs, and in which case, how does that work when you think about the metaverse? You know, how does it work when you think about what's happening online? And I think what I discovered, just researching that quickly, there are about 16 luxury brands who are active in the metaverse, and not just active in the metaverse, but profitable. So they're talking about uh, services, they're talking about um, connecting the virtual with the real. So usually it's done to, to um, sell a product, to uh, talk about a store, to play a game where you're collecting not just um, NFTs or tokens, but you're actually collecting products from the store itself. But also, I think it's where it's been used as an extension of the brand. And how a number of brands have done this is to actually supply their high-end client with their own gilded, I thought this was quite funny, their own gilded um, Oculus Quest set. So think about the headset. How do you get people into the metaverse? So a lot of the time, we think they shouldn't be in there because they're older, they're not using the technology. And what a lot of brands are doing is saying, actually, why don't we bring them in? Why don't we make that part of our hosting servers? And why don't we then have conversations with them, both in the metaverse and without, to show them what this possibility or what these things could be? So I think that that is kind of how you're seeing the division between brands that are just gamifying the metaverse, because that's the kind of first point of entry, to brands who are already exploring opportunity across age groups within that metaverse or, or, or existence. Um, another question, I think not kind of um, hugely departing from a similar theme, is people asking about things like deep fakes, you know, um, if you think about stable diffusion, for example, you know, using technology to create, um, well, is it moments of hyper-realism or, you know, better ways to improve a brand? Or is it this uh, person asking the question and said, look, is it also a way how increasingly um, fake news and deep fakes have strayed into a world? And if that's the case, what does it mean for brands? Do they challenge them? Do we accept them? Do they um, have open conversations with consumers about them? And I guess my thinking is that, first of all, this is nothing new. You know, if you look historically within any media or medium, you always found the issue of fakes and of how people were faking uh, what reality could look like. So I'm just simply thinking about if anybody, you know, if you're into conspiracy theories or, or you remember um, in the 70s, there was a great, uh, those pictures of the Loch Ness Monster, which turned out to be fake, uh, famous Yeti photographs, which turned out to be fake. I'm gonna name one, which everybody will certainly, uh, if you're interested in photography, would know about, you know, the great Robert, Robert Kappa photograph called Falling Soldier. You know, the soldier that shot mid-action, it became the most celebrated image and possibly the most famous image in history. And yet, as we subsequently discovered, it is a fake. So I think we, we need to remind ourselves that historically, these things have always happened. It's how we deal with it, how we interpret it, how we have the conversations, but also perhaps how we check the data flows and streams. Because I think increasingly, a lot of companies are asking for verification systems to be installed so that they can trace the origin. So think about how the blockchain has been used in certain areas, but now we're saying, why not use it? Because if a product or if a brand or if an image that is associated with a brand is put through a fairly simple uh, uh, kind of AI diffusion system, it can turn up the most dangerous and uh, most challenge challengeable images. And I think this is where a lot of those questions are coming from, because currently it's harvesting images from across the internet without necessarily discriminating about what it's hoovering up. And I think in a lot of the cases, when you look at, at what's been happening recently, a lot of those images are illegal. A lot of them are questionable and challengeable. And I think this is where brands need to have a clear 
stance on it. So hopefully that has answered um, the question of that. I'm just looking to see um, a question here about regenerative culture. Uh, is this going to be taken seriously or is it more likely to be just the new buzzword? Uh, I can stop there because I think I exactly know the question you're asking. I think this is this is my thinking as well. But, you know, my my uh, point is that we did start talking about sustainability and that did shift a lot of, of um, conversations in terms of brands, how CEOs had to look at the issue, how governments and, and, and corporations as well had to really embrace sustainability, not as a social issue, which I think is, is, is kind of how it used to be, or a um, an environmental issue, as it was at one point, but also as a political issue. You know, voters were really concerned about how you felt on sustainability if you were a government or a politician or an MP, et cetera, running for office. I think that's great if you're in your 40s and 50s and 60s. But if I talk to people in their 30s and 20s, the word regenerative is how they're seeing it. It's not the same as sustainable. Sustainable as well, if something is sustaining or you're sustaining something, surely you're just sustaining the status quo. So if things are bad, you're just sustaining badness. You're not actually challenging to do better or demonstrating how you can do better. So I think the point and the reason I suspect why regenerative has come in as a term and why a lot of, of um, if you look at our Futures 100 um, entrepreneurs, for example, to them, it's a standard term. It isn't a term that's interchangeable with sustainability. It's a term that builds on it because their point is, if we're just sustaining things, that's really not helping the planet. So we need to look to circular, yes, but then if you're circulating or circular, recycling things that are already in the system, you're not really tackling the bigger issue. So regenerative is a term, I believe, is not just replacing it, it's telling us a different story and taking us down a different path about how we need to understand our engagement with the world tomorrow. So it's kind of, you know, I, I get the point, but I think we do need to consider it. So uh, somebody here is, is, can you give an example of what you mean by the home, home body economy? Well, I think that the, the original term was really to describe how the house or our homes during COVID became a core source, not just of revenue for brands, because that's where a lot of us had to, to live and work and, and um, enjoy ourselves in, but also we're now understanding that people have really reworked the sense of home. So in terms of turning it into a hybrid space, so work, rest, play, um, turning it into a space where we're actively entertaining. So it's not just kind of passive, what I call slouch leisure, it's active leisure. So growth in uh, the, the, the kind of kitchen disco, growth in home bars, um, growth in, in, in um, home book studies, growth in how, for example, we are using different houses. Somebody described to me a whole notion of a circuit party. And I go, oh, what do you mean by that? Well, where five or six houses agree over an evening to take part in the event. So you can move from A to B to C to D, uh, meeting different people, uh, doing different things, but also just changing the nature of how we socialize and how we kind of engage with people. So I do think that the, the, um, the whole body economy, which is something we focus on quite a lot uh, on LSN, is something to be separated from and segregated from what I call the going out economy, or um, what's happening now in, in, in kind of um, travel and hospitality. So it's just really worth watching and seeing how much these things will be changing. I'm just checking to see if um, we have any more questions. There was one question which, which um, somebody was asking about um, AI. We talk a lot about AI and data, and we've done recently a piece about um, AI and data and creativity. And I just wanted to remind people that, you know, with uh, if you if you've been following as I've been following, you know, chat uh, GPT, you know, that, the, the kind of chat bot can answer every question. It can write um, haiku verses. It can um, 
you know, compose minor symphonies, not major symphonies. But somebody said, well, is there a point where we won't need uh, advertising copywriters? We won't need people to do strategy. We won't need people to do a lot of the things that we, we thought were previously protected from robots because they required creative input. I think the short answer and, and the interesting answer is already, uh, if you look at what um, equivalents to chat um, GPT are producing, they are pretty sharp and stunning stuff. I saw some examples of strategy documents and copyright, uh, advertising copywritten pieces written by bots and similar bots, and they were pretty spot on. If, and I say this advisedly because I can see the person is, is typing quickly already, if you accept mediocrity, as a viable solution in terms of your advertising and your marketing and, and, and how your brand should be. However, it is learning. And the whole point of these systems is a bit like the, the, the um, stable diffusion. As they hoover and as they take in and as they research and cogitate, you see the word cogitate, as they start thinking about what the context of what the capturing means, that's when they start learning. So if you read, and I'll just kind of give you an advice in a book, it's called The Creativity Code, which came out, I think it's probably about a year and a half now. And it's uh, Marcus Sassantoy, who really looked at all of the systems that are there. And he says that actually already, he, they, they are composing symphonies, producing works of art, um, creating images that are pretty difficult to detect or separate from what we would expect from a competent to good to brilliant artist. So I think what we're beginning to see is a whole growth in the field of, of, of um, AI, of neuroesthetics. I keep using that term because I will put a bet on, now that I've mentioned it to you, and also neuro arts, you will see it everywhere. It's also one of the big shifts we are seeing for 2023 is how science is being used to, well, underpin and prove beauty and aesthetics in a way that was absolutely um, almost unprecedented because suddenly as artists, as uh, designers, as architects, we can prove that beauty and the things we are producing that look beautiful are also driving, dare I say the S word, you know, sales, driving um, uh, kind of revenues, but also uplifting brand value and value. So a lot of things in those areas, science, tech, data, AI, deep learning, suddenly will come to fruition in a way that I think a lot of brands are not really expecting. So let's, uh, the last question there, if you have any more, please do, send in any questions to the team here we can answer it so if you can if we can move on to the slide that looks at our um well just a quick reminder of the report um 50 crossover trends cross sector trends rather uh, industry disruptor interviews and also quite a lot of detail about the trends that are driving value for 2023 so if you want to get a copy of the report or the collection, the, the, the webinar that goes with it, just um, go on to the Future Laboratory website. I just have a few more seconds, few more minutes rather. I'm just gonna tell you about some of our uh, calendar events for 2023. But first, no, I'll be warned here by Jaylene to go back to our membership, LSN Global Membership. Some of you know who are tuned in are members. Some of you have been asking about membership. You can see there are most of the things that you can get on offer from the membership, you know, both from a strat point of view, uh, from the kind of webinars, which I think really deliver on thinking and insight in a way that makes them actionable, but also crucially access to uh, pretty much all of the news and insights you need to know and read about to make you better understand the consumer journey for the coming year. And finally, um, if you're part of the network, you should also join up to the Future Laboratories community group. It's community network, so it's not just news and updates. Uh, it's not just access to all of our online events. It's not just live chat like this, whether you like it 
What do you need to leave it? And it's not just about in-person meet and greet. It's also putting you in touch with all other members of the community to have conversations outside our network, outside your own network more crucially, but in a way that allows you to develop deeper, more useful and more strategic and profitable relationships. And that's all for, as I've been reminded again, by the team here for 450 pounds. And then finally, have a look at that. It's what I call the great future Battenberg. It contains all of the things that you need to think about for 2023. So from our future forecast, which we've just done, uh, retail futures in April, uh, September are luxury and hospitality futures, 19th of October, a date not to be missed, which of course is our trend briefing 2024. So happens in 2023, look forward to the following year. Uh, November, we're launching our community futures report. So the myths about Gen Z, millennials, what's happened to them, uh, Gen X, and of course, boomers. So what is going on in their lives that will help you better understand how to speak to them? And as with always, uh, we come back full circle. We're back to future forecast 2024 coming out in December, which then just resets the year to come again. So there we have it. Many thanks for listening. Um, keep the questions coming in. Uh, we will answer them on our community. And if you have any questions for me, uh, please send them to martin at thefuturelaboratory.com. Thank you for watching and listening.